So good evening and welcome to um, this lecture, which is called Beyond Tolerance. Um, it's part of uh, the University of Chester's Diversity Festival. Um, there are lots more events that are going on and around this, so please feel free to have a look at the programme that's on the university's website um, to see the different things that are going on. So thank you so much for being here. Um, if I can introduce myself, my name is James Holt. Um, I'm Associate Professor of Religious Education here at the University of Chester. Um, I work in the Education Department. Um, so my main role is um, working with primary and secondary school teachers or people who are training to be primary or secondary school teachers in the areas of religious education and, and I touch base with, with a few other things as well. So thank you so much um, for being here. So what will happen tonight is um, we won't finish later than eight o'clock at the very latest. Um, so I will talk for a period of time. I can never gauge how long that will be. I think up to about 40 minutes. And then if there are any questions and so on, then I will take those then. Please feel free to put questions into the chat, but I won't be able to see the chat just because I'm projecting my screen until at the very end. And so I will come back and answer some of those questions. So again, thank you. Thank you for being here and taking time out of your busy lives to um, be with me tonight. Um, so I think the first question we need to ask when we're discussing the topic beyond tolerance is what is tolerance? Um, what do we mean by it? And is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it both? All of those things kind of together. Now, originally, um, and this is where you, we always start, isn't it, with kind of the dictionary, the etymology of the word tolerance is it, it comes from Old French and it means endurance or fortitude in the face of pain or hardship. And so we often talk about um, a high pain tolerance or tolerating some things with which we don't particularly like. And um, as I mentioned, I work in the area of um, religious education. So I've done a lot of work with regards to interfaith in teaching religions and kind of just working between religions, though the things that I am talking about tonight um, extend to race, um, to ethnicity, um, to issues of gender, um, which is obviously important today as it's International um, Women's Day. So all the things that I talk about kind of can go into one and we can begin to explore issues of tolerance within each of those areas. Um, but one of the things that I came across um, when we explore these different types of things is that it's a very positive thing in terms of government, in terms of um, what we are told. Um, and we have International Day of Tolerance, which is in November. Um, and so that's great. Um, we also have within um, the school system, certainly in England, we have British values, one of which is mutual respect and tolerance of those with different faiths, beliefs and for those without faith. And then also we have uh, an example from last year um, with the Department for Education who tweeted, um, we're encouraging schools across the UK to celebrate one Britain, one nation day when children can learn about our shared values of tolerance, kindness, pride and respect. So when the government established um, British values um, in light of the Trojan horse affair, which obviously has since proven to be um, false, and in preparation, I think, for an election, establishing tolerance was one of those things that, that became a good thing. And when we talk to people about tolerance and when we talk about it in um, the workplace and we talk about it just in society, it is seen to be a very positive um, value to have. And so that's great. We think, OK, well, yes, that's that's what we should be doing. I want people, whether it's my religion, or whether it's someone else's ethnicity or gender to um, respect, uh, have that mutual respect where we're able to, as the, as the picture in the bottom left hand corner suggests, to spread kindness. So all of that sounds really good. But then I look at um, some of my other experiences, so some of the other experiences I've had. And I mentioned before that I teach religion and I also am religious myself, but sometimes, certainly early on in my career, I would meet people from my faith community and they would be worried about me. And they would be worried that by working with people or studying or learning about or teaching about 
people of other religions that somehow that would um, affect me. So they didn't have a problem with people being other or, or being other religions. The issue came with how it would affect me. And 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 John Hull, who is a who is a great religious educationist, um, educationalist, said, "I am holy." The argument says, and you are holy. But the ground between us is unholy ground and will contaminate each other through harmful mingling of blood if we meet. So that kind of suggests that there is a, OK, I'm OK here. I'm me. I've got my kind of silo or where I live and and the experiences that I have. And you're over there. I accept your right to be over there and be who you want to be. But please, I don't really want anything to do with you. Now, um, I'm going to show a fairly graphic image now, so I do apologize um, for this. Those of you who follow me on social media we may have already seen this, so I do apologize. I'm going to, it might trigger some people. Oh, I even skipped over it too fast. So, this is an example of something that I tolerate. Okay, I have tolerance for Manchester United, which means I kind of recognize its right to exist and Manchester United fans right to exist but really I don't want anything to do with them and because I just don't understand them it's okay I understand maybe um they they won a number of trophies at one point but do you know what why and so I have a tolerance for I recognize their right to exist now obviously I I don't really mean that but but it kind of indicates um, in a very safe way, the idea that sometimes we tolerate people, we kind of put people into pigeonholes and we're, we're kind of OK with them being who they want to be, just so long as it doesn't affect us. Um, now, sometimes it's quite nice that they exist. So on Sunday um, when Manchester City won 4-1, it was quite nice that Manchester United existed and, and that their fans existed so that I could then take the mickey out of them um, as, as was appropriate. Um, but it, but it, it kind of indicates that, that level of acceptance. But if we take it to a more um, actual level, because, I mean, we know football isn't, isn't life and death un unless you're Bill Shankly, we begin to look at how tolerance kind of plays out within local communities, within education systems. And what that obviously we've talked about a lot over the last couple of years is the idea of decolonization. So the importance of decolonizing our curriculums. And so in history, that has been the recognition of um, problems associated with empire, but also a recognition of um, historians or people from history from different backgrounds. And certainly within my own subject, religious education, it's been the idea of, well, let's consider some of the language that we use as well, as well as some of the authors and, and some of the writers. And Bell Hooks, who is, is probably my favorite educationalist with, with her writing and, and all of the things that she said, she she talked a number of years ago um, and said this, she said, all too often we found a will to include those considered marginal without a willingness to accord their work the same respect and consideration given to other work. So this is the idea that, OK, what tolerance does, if you like, or what recognition does, is it it's almost tokenistic. It gives people a place at the table, but doesn't give them the same voice, the same rights or anything else. And so if we look at a curriculum or if we look at other things that are, are going on in and around us, we might have a tokenistic approach to diversity. But what Bell Hook suggests and, 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 and others is actually we need to accord them or afford them the same rights. So one of the areas that I work in is the inclusion of smaller religions. And so I often argue that smaller religions should be talked about, should be taught about and everything else. And one of the issues that I always come across is that those people who have a place at the table already are happy enough for, to give someone else a seat. But at the same time, just as long as they don't speak too much or it's not, you can do project work on this. And so what we have to be very careful about is that 
tolerance is kind of a for me and we'll talk about this throughout um the session is kind of the bare minimum is something that we yes work towards but also we should go beyond because it's doing something more than giving someone a place at, at the table and david cameron talked about something called passive tolerance and this i think is is perhaps sometimes the way that life works and hopefully perhaps not the way that we work but it but it is the way that life works sometimes and he went further i think in a guardian article where he suggested that under, that under the doctrine of state multiculturalism we've encouraged different cultures to live separate lives apart from each other and apart from the mainstream we fail to pro provide a vision of society to which they feel they want to belong now there are all kinds of issues with with um, the language in here because there's there's we there's them there's us so there are difficulties with that but essentially what he's saying is that society has been structured and we have this tolerance um but there is no celebration there's no interaction that enables society to flourish people are very happy to live in silos in, in different places and an example of this for me was in 2001 so this is a picture of the Oldham riots from 2001 um, some of you may remember them some of you may not it's just north of where I live so so it kind of did have quite a big impact on the local community and in some ways, these riots in 2001, for some people, came out of nowhere. Because in essence, there were two communities in Oldham. There were more than that, but there were two communities that, that this affected. And there was a, a white working class community um, estate, and there was also an Asian kind of working class estate as well. And that there was... <laughs> It was it wasn't enforced segregation. It was just where the two communities lived and, and there was an uneasy tolerance. So there wasn't anything that majorly happened between the two communities, but they were happy to to live separate lives. And something happened and I don't know which way around it is, but one of the communities was seen to be favoured above the other. So they perhaps received more funding for something or, or, or something else. And that kicked off. And the council or, or members of the local authority, some of whom were, were very shocked by this because they'd seen essentially two communities who lived side by side without too much issue in tolerance. But that was the problem is that it was kind of, there was no community as such. There was just a tolerance. Okay, if you stay over there in your lane and you stay over there in your lane, then we're absolutely fine but the moment that something happened then that tolerance was easily broken because essentially what was aimed for was the least um not the least appropriate there were there were worse things that could have happened but but essentially they were aiming for for the lowest possible thing which was look just so long as there there's appearance of peace then that's absolutely fine and sometimes what happens is that um, there are laws in place, there are things in place that kind of show an intolerance, but at the same time are also used. So there was a court case last year, although this is the 2004 law, um, the European Union decided last year that what would happen is that all political and religious symbols can be banned by a company or by an organization so i suppose the question is we can tolerate your religion but please don't express it in the workplace was perhaps the the kind of idea behind this law it's a bit more complicated than that but that's there what's interesting and i i i am chair of a, a charity that looks at um human rights and recently we've been doing some interviews with um, people from all different walks of life and we've been asking kind of how are freedoms found within um, society and all of them have said well the thing is I don't think anyone sets out government Whitehall local authorities universities whoever that might be they've all said well we don't think that governments set out to be intolerant but there are certain policies and practices that are that show intolerance that kind of overlook people and that's the thing is that the passive tolerance means that some things fall through the cracks and so sometimes when 
um, policies are made, they are made by people sometimes who don't have the same understanding and the understanding of what it's like, if you like, to be a minority. And so don't really think, OK, how will this affect somebody? And Darren McGarvey wrote a very insightful book called Poverty Safari about his life in, in Pollock in Glasgow. And he talks about people coming in to establish policies and programs. And essentially, he says enthusiasm, excuse me, enthusiasm to take part, be active in communities, quickly dissipates when people realize the local democracy isn't really designed with them in mind. It's designed primarily so that people from outside the community can retain control of it over the heads of those who live there. Now, that was his feeling. But I think when we look at society as a whole, if someone is in a minority, um, a lot of the laws, a lot of the policies and practices are made by people who are in a majority for the most part. And so when they're establishing laws or they're establishing policies, what they're doing is they're coming at it from their experience and also their understanding of the minority experience. And with the best will in the world, uh, we can't always understand the experience of those who are not us. We have to listen to those voices. And so we have to be very conscious that it's not just about this passive tolerance where we're kind of making sure that people have the things that they need. It's about listening to people and including those voices so that the needs are actually met rather than those assuming what it is that they need. And so it's, it's, it's going back to that bell hooks um, quote from earlier, which is, OK, we we give people and, and we're able to have places at the table. But at the same time, people need to be free to express their views. And also we need to consult, perhaps if we're establishing procedures or policies that actually do it. And sometimes it's 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 not a nefarious action. It's just an unthinking action. So I was at um, a meeting the other uh, a few weeks ago and um, it was a very laudable meeting. It was about increasing diversity within um, a particular community and recognizing the different religious communities that were were within it. And one of one of the religious communities was missed out. And so it, it required people to, to stop and to think. And it wasn't that people were being horrible or mean. It was just unthinking. And I think that's where I think we need to go beyond tolerance, because it's about not just, OK, you're over there, but actually celebrating and learning and respecting people from from um, whoever that other might be. Listen, you little wiseacre. I'm smart. You're dumb. I'm big. You're little. I'm right. You're wrong. And there's nothing you can do about it. And sometimes that's the way we kind of work is that if we are in a and, and, and this is where it becomes incumbent on us. So sometimes we are in a position of power. Sometimes we are in a position of a minority. And when sometimes we we transfer from one to the other, it's about making sure that we engage with and remember those experiences that that we've had or perhaps that we listened to, or not perhaps but that we listen to people so that we can understand the experiences that we're having that they're having so we don't just translate that from our own experiences and think okay well that meets it we have to listen now john locke um he wrote um, a letter about toleration so he's an english philosopher um from a long time ago i can't remember actually when he lived um but he he wrote a letter called a letter about toleration and um just to explain his language at the time that he wrote there were basically christians jews and pagans everybody else outside of that so that's what he means by pagan is anyone who's not essentially a christian or a jew so he says therefore peace equity and friendship are always mutually to be observed without any pretense of superiority or jurisdiction over one another whether the man excuse the um misogynistic language is christian or pagan he is to be kept safe from violence and injury indeed we should go beyond mere justice adding benevolence and charity the gospel commands this region reason urges this and it's favored by the natural fellowship we're born into so john locke uses this um idea of tolerance 
and he moves it forwards. He kind of says, OK, yes, this is what it is, but actually we need to go further than this. It's keeping people safe from violence and injury, but also not just the negation of, of, of evil, if you like, but also benevolence and charity. That's not throwing people a bone, that's showing people love, it's showing people respect. And so even hundreds of years ago, John Locke was talking about, well, do you know what, tolerance isn't enough but he understood tolerance in this way, which is really good. And I think if that's the way we understand it, then that's great. But I think sometimes we use tolerance as the lowest common um, kind of factor that we can focus on. And there are others who, who kind of talk about the same thing. So Martin Luther King, he talks about how in a real sense, all life is interrelated. The agony of the poor enriches the rich. We're inevitably our brother's keeper because we're our brother's brother. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And then he talks about how we we can't be satisfied until everybody has the same rights and the same opportunities that we have, whoever we are. Because I think that's one of the problems is that sometimes um, when communities or individuals rise from or are given different opportunities or perhaps are given a large voice at the table, sometimes what can happen is they can forget what it was like um, to be in a minority. And they can think, okay, well, I'm okay. So therefore, um, I don't need to do anything about some of the kind of underlying causes of socio socioeconomic problems or prejudice or anything like that, because I have risen above it. So therefore, I can forget about all of those things because I don't want to go back down there either. And, and, and we need to think about that because in, in some ways, all of us have a minority experience of one kind or another. Um, depending on, on our backgrounds and everything else, we may have differing socioeconomic backgrounds. And because we've come out of that um, particular background and we flourished, then therefore we can forget about where we, we came from. Well, actually, that's not the case. We need to be very conscious that it's not just about me, it's about everybody, and that everybody has those same rights and, re and responsibilities that, that we've spoken about. Now, Emmanuel Levinas is, is um, a Jewish philosopher, and he talks um, about the other. And one of the things that he talks about is that um, it's important to talk so he says in the middle of this quote, language is universal because it's the very passage from the individual to the general, because it offers things which are mine to the other. To speak is to make the world common, to create common places. And so what he's saying is that actually that we live in a world full of others. And, and what we, I suppose what we do is we draw boundaries and, and demarcation points. But actually, the way that we are able to break those boundaries down is through language or through communication. And later on um, in the same essay, he talks about a face to face encounter and that when we're face to face with someone, um, we are. Well, actually, he uses the phrase, we're not going to kill them. But actually, what he means by that is that our impulse to be different and to focus on those differences disappear. And so if we are to go beyond tolerance, it's about developing relationships, developing communication with those people who perhaps we perceive to be other. And that's a, a conversation or a real dialogue rather than a one way kind of monologue type of thing that that uh, Levinas talks about. This is one of my um, favourite sculptures. I'll show you my other favourite sculpture in a moment. It's called Unholy Ground. And if we go back to the very beginning where we looked at um, you're holy, I'm holy, but we don't want to mingle. This is the idea. So it's an image of the burning bush um, and people have taken their shoes off because it's it's holy ground. And um, Jeff Teese, um, sorry, this is this quote, says it's the space between us that constitutes holy ground holiness being discovered through encounter. So in some of the things that I write and talk about, I talk about a third space, a transformational third space. And what I mean by that is that whenever we encounter 
the other, whatever the other may be, whether that's a piece of literature, whether that's another person, when we are in dialogue with them, with a person especially, we are transformed. It's an area of risk, but I come away from that conversation and from that engagement knowing more about the other but also understanding my place and who I am more as well and so to move beyond tolerance it's not a case of well we separate it's a case of well we need to come together we need to experience people we need to understand people and that only happens through conversation and so I was at um a diversity festival event yesterday called Sharing Our Stories, where um, three people, um, including myself, shared um, experiences of being in a minority. And just listening means that I now understand a little bit more. And so I am perhaps a little bit more caring in the way that I view um, certain minority characteristics and, and so on. Now, I can do that logically and I can read about things and I can come to those conclusions, but actually, the most important aspect of it is in our interpersonal relationships because as Levinas said as others have suggested this conversation breaks down so many barriers as we're able to talk and work with one another um, this is my other favorite sculpture and, and I often use this when I'm in face-to-face -face kind of trainings and say okay what you now need to do is try to recreate that image um, using your hands and so um obviously if i asked you to do that now you would sit there and you would struggle and, and everything else and if i'm doing that in a face-to-face -face situation within a couple of minutes somebody will realize that those are two right hands so for just about everybody i know in fact everybody i know and uh, it's impossible because the which is that um statue or that or that image can only be recreated by two people and sometimes there is a tendency to want to do things for ourselves and so we try and do everything ourselves but actually in life life is about community and about our relationship to that community as well and so it whatever issues kind of that are going on on a societal level and also most likely on an individual level we have to be willing to take that step of faith and open up to others and allow, if you like, the problems to be solved by working in community or by in relationship with other people. And that might be with one other person. It might be with 50 other people. I don't know. But it's it's it, it's important that we recognize that tolerance doesn't create a community. It might provide the background where people are free to meet together but they have to be willing to work together as well and come together through conversation, through work and, and through community. And sometimes we find people who don't want our help. And Edwin Markham, who's a, an American poet, he said he drew a circle that shut me out, heretic rebel, a thing to flout. But Love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle and took him in. So it's the idea that, yes, sometimes and, and this is. This is difficult. Because if we are placed on the periphery or if we're placed outside something, then our immediate reaction is to say, well, stuff them then. I, do, I don't want anything to do with uh, that particular group or I don't want to participate and I don't want to do any of those things. But the suggestion here is that, that we would draw a circle that incorporates others, that we essentially get over ourselves and, and kind of include um, people who perhaps would not include us. And so it's it's about moving beyond and, and, and kind of thinking. Now, that we'll talk about some limits to this later, um, but I think that is important. Now, a couple of religious examples. So Joseph Smith, who was the founder of, of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, he said, the saints can testify whether I'm willing to lay down my life for my brethren. If it's been demonstrated that I've been willing to die for a Mormon, I'm bold to declare before heaven that I'm just as ready to die in defending the rights of a Presbyterian, a Baptist, or a good man of any other denomination. For the same principle which would trample upon the rights of the Latter-day Saints would trample upon the rights of any other denomination. So that's kind of going back to Martin Luther King and others, that it's not enough just to have those rights for ourselves. We need to be arguing, we need to be fighting for the rights of others.
I've spent um, a good part of the last year. I'll come back to him in a moment. I've spent the last the uh, the best part of the last year or so um, researching and working within the Sikh community, and um, I think just because that's where I am. If we look at Guru Nanak and and his view of the world, then again it just shows the importance of breaking down that community. So Valerie Kaur, who's an American author, kind of shares this view of, of Guru Nanak. She says, five centuries ago, the story goes, halfway around the world in a village in Punjab on the um, Indian subcontinent, there lived a young man named Nanak. He was deeply troubled by the violence around him, Hindus and Muslims in turmoil. One day he disappeared on the river for three days. People thought he was dead, drowned. But Nanak emerged on the third day with a vision of oneness, Ikonkar the oneness of humanity in the world. This vision threw him into a state of ecstatic wonder known as Vismad. And he began singing songs of devotion called Shabbats, praising the divine within him and around him. In other words, he was in love. Love made him see with new eyes. Everyone around him was a part of him that he did not yet know. I see no stranger, said Guru Nanak, I see no enemy. Guru Nanak taught that all of us could see the world in this way. There is a voice inside each of us called How Am I? the eye that separate that names itself as separate from you it resides in the bowl that holds our individual consciousness but separateness is an illusion so he was very much uh, 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 even if we we don't accept him as a religious leader or, or as our guru he was very much a great philosopher and, and he rejected dualism and what he said was everything is the same and part of the same and so if we're rejecting or we're hurting others, then we're only really hurting ourselves. And I've, I've used two religious examples there, but obviously Richard Dawkins is not religious. In fact, he's, he's a person that, that we can find. But he talks about the value of human, human life. Um, and in his book on weaving the rainbow, he, he talks about this value of life. We're going to die and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they're never going to be born. The potential people who could have been here in my place, but who will in fact never see the light of day, outnumber the sand grains of the Sahara. Um, and then he carries on at the bottom. Admittedly, we didn't arrive by spaceship. We arrived by being born. And we didn't just burst into consciousness into the world, but accumulated awareness gradually through babyhood. The fact that we gradually apprehend our world rather than suddenly discovering it should not subtract from its wonder. So I think all three of these individuals, Joseph Smith and, and Richard Dawkins and Guru Nana, what they do is they recognize the value of human life. And not just that it exists, but that it is interconnected as well. And so that if we recognize the value of our life as individuals, we should also recognize the value of everyone else's life and so that the way that we treat other people the way that we interact with other people goes way beyond the tolerance which is okay yes i recognize your right to exist but it goes beyond that and recognizes the value that uh, that other people not just bring to the world but bring to us as well and so if all we do is tolerate then it kind of misses the point of existence really if you like however we view existence um but it's a risky activity so again returning to to bell hook she talks about the way that she teaches and one of the things that she says in the classes i teach students are often presented with new paradigms and are being asked to shift their ways of thinking to consider new perspectives and in essence that's what going beyond tolerance does for all of us we have to open ourselves up to new ways of thinking. So we may have lived a life where perhaps of privilege. So um, as is fairly obvious, I am a white man. So I really have never exp experienced racism in any way, shape or form. But to open myself up, to listen to somebody else, to explain to me and to try and help me understand their own experiences of racism well that that makes me that makes me take a risk and it makes me think well is there anything that i have done that may have added to a person's burden and so it's a risky thing because we perhaps will change the way that we think and the way that we act 
because we're listening to someone else. And that's why that third space is transformational, because as we go through that difficult conversation where we perhaps realize that we're not the center of the universe and there are other people's experiences and everything else, that it changes the way we think and it perhaps changes the way that we act as well. And it might not do, it might just solidify where we are and think, okay, yes, I already knew that and that's the way that I'm going. But it's, as she says, I've often felt that this type of learning process is very hard, it's painful and troubling. And sometimes leaving behind all of those things that we perhaps knew and took for granted and just accepted without thinking, well, if we're going to change our worldview and change the way that we view others, that can be quite painful um, and quite a, an angst ridden process. And it might take some time for us to go through that process. So I've kind of talked about how important going beyond tolerance is and accepting and respecting and all of those things. But I suppose the question is one of the well, one of the other aspects of going beyond tolerance is recognizing that there are things that we don't tolerate as well. And this is problematic because by saying that we don't tolerate something or don't have tolerance for something, we are making a value judgment. And so how on earth do we make those judgments? So um, in terms of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, Article 18 is about the freedom of thought and of conscience. Um, on here, these are, the, these are the permissible restrictions according to the UN Declaration. It's about just requirements of morality, public order and general welfare. And so, for example, there were certain religious freedoms that were restricted through COVID to protect public health. Now, some people may disagree with those, but there are permissible restrictions on human rights. So uh, when we think about the freedom of speech, yes, we're free to speak, to, to say what we want, but at the same time, there comes with that a responsibility not to hurt others and to be conscious of those things. Now, this is where it, I don't mean it becomes murky, but when we say that there are possible restrictions or limitations, we then move and, and look at issues such as uh, the treatment of the Yazidi or the treatment of the Uyghurs in, in, um, in China. So that, for me, those are not permissible restrictions. And, and I don't think by any standard they would be considered to be. But at the same time, how do we as a tolerant society, how, how do we decide what can have restrictions placed on them? So, for example, I mentioned before the banning of headscarves is that. Should we be free to say, well, actually, no, um, you can't wear headscarves or you can't wear turbans or you can't um, wear religious symbols. Now, I suppose the question is, where does that freedom stop? So for me, people wearing religious symbols do not constitute any form of risk to society. And so therefore, this is this is an unfair restriction. But then there are certain symbols um, that should be restricted. So, for example, the, 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 uh, the swastika of, of Nazism. So how do how do we draw that line and, and do we kind of say, OK, for, for, for these people, this is offensive, so therefore we don't. Or do we look at the whole of society as a whole? There's another example is, is female genital mutilation. This is um, an act of patriarchal violence. It is um, wrong, wrong by any um, standard of British society and it's against the law. But then for some, it's a cultural tradition. Now, British law still says, no, that will not be tolerated. And so there are things, and I, I do fully agree with that um, outlawing of it or that criminalization of it, because it is an act of, of patriarchal violence that just is unjustifiable. But how do we draw those lines? Because there are things that we need to celebrate, that we need to respect, that we need to understand. But then there's other things that we need to say no to. And so it's it's interesting how those things are made. So by saying that we need to go beyond tolerance, I suppose what I'm saying is, yes, we need to go beyond it in celebrating things and respecting. But at the same time, there will be things that we need to not tolerate as well. And, and that um, tolerance is far too 
far to go that, that we need to stop um, short of that really. Um, and, and this kind of process, just going back to bell hooks, it's a practice of freedom because we respect and care for the souls of everybody. And that's really key, is that we are respecting and, and caring for everybody. And sometimes there will be systemic things in place. And so there are systemic examples of intolerance. And so in some ways we have control over those because we are part of systems, we are part of organisations. But systems and, and organisations respond to individuals. So one of the things that I, I perhaps speak about regularly in terms of my own experience is every organization that I have worked in has had um, systems and practices in place that um, support and respect diversity. The problem is that they're not always lived up to, not because the organization doesn't see them as positive, it's because the individuals who perhaps um, don't implement them as they should be. So we need to be conscious as individuals that we are supporting and strengthening the systems that are in place. And so there's things that we can do, and, and this is for us as individuals in going beyond, is that we be with others. So it's not just enough to, to be with people that kind of are like us. And sometimes that might mean going outside of our kind of safe little bubble. We need to recognize the bias that we have because we do have those biases. They may not be expressed, but sometimes there will be bias in, in the way that we read things or, or see things. It's to listen and learn, listen and learn to everybody and kind of exercise humility that we don't know other people's experiences. And we need to help kind of listen and learn and protect the rights of others, speak out against injustice. So just because it doesn't affect me, doesn't mean that we we don't speak out and then consider the intentional and unintentional consequences of actions and words. So as as I consider kind of all the things that we've spoken about and we've we've I, I've waffled on for over 40 minutes now is the importance of really recognizing our position and all of us will be in a position of privilege some of us may be in a position of a minority as well but at the same time, we need to make sure that the way that we are talking and responding to others is a positive thing so that people feel as though we care, not just feel as though we care, but recognize that we actually do care and are a part of that. So when we talk about going beyond tolerance, tolerance is the bare minimum that we should be aiming for in all aspects of our lives. We should be focusing on celebration, on respect and understanding. And when we may not feel able to celebrate some things, and that may be fine, but it's about respecting and understanding and trying to understand others as well.